I think I'm ready for the retreat. I have everything except the kitchen sink. Oh, nope. There's the kitchen sink. Good morning, everybody. It's Stephen here for Bland Designs, and this is my weekly vlog for Monday, March the 9th, 2020, number 158. And so what have we been up to? Well, first of all, right off the bat, let me apologize for not having a Stephen and Walter live this past Sunday, yesterday. Uh, we intended to do one, but as you know, and I'm gonna be talking about this a little bit more later, we were at a sewing retreat for the last four days. I thought we would be home in time to do the live broadcast yesterday, uh, and we were, but to be honest, we were just zonked out. We had to unpack everything that we had taken, and you saw in the little teaser at the beginning of this, uh, my little pile, well, that was just a small amount. We packed the car, four sewing machines, tables, our clothes, our supplies, our projects, the whole bit. We had everything in that car except the kitchen sink, and I'm sure if we'd had room, we would have taken that too. So, by the time we got home, we got unpacked and that, we were just too tired to go on air. So we'll tell you more about the retreat. Uh, I will tell you more today on the vlog and we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail um, next Sunday on the live. And while I'm talking about the live, the live will be next Sunday as usual at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you're new to my channel, and I have had quite a few new uh, subscribers in the last month, Please, uh, if you've got the time, check us out on the live. We have a lot of fun there and we talk about, well, who knows what we talk about. Anything goes. Okay, so let's move right into the projects that I did uh, work on at the retreat. Now, I always take more than what I know I'm possibly going to get done. So just in case, and as, as usual, I took five projects. I worked on two and I got the two of them almost done and so you can see one of them right behind me and this if you look at it closely you will notice there's a lot of cats on this uh, little quilt this was going to be a bed runner but now with the borders and everything on it it's a good size throw I am uh, making this as a gift for the lady who shares the room with my mother in the nursing home her name is Peggy and I noticed back when mom first moved in with her that uh, she had a large picture of a cat. And I asked her about the cat, and I guess apparently it was her cat, and it's still alive, uh, but because she's in the nursing home, she can't have the cat with her, which I find very, very sad. Um, she, the cat's being looked after, lives with uh, relatives. Now, I don't know much about this lady's background, except that uh, a couple of months ago, she lost her husband. Uh, her husband was also in the same nursing home. Uh, they had them in separate rooms, which I don't know how often they got to see each other. Again, I think that's kind of sad. Um, but anyways, I don't think she has any children. Um, and so now she's kind of on her own. Now, I think she does have a brother that comes to visit her and look after her financial, you know, stuff and things like that. Um, but I thought, well, you know, she's sharing a room with my mother. She's a really nice lady. And since I know she likes cats, I saw this fabric and I thought of her. And so I am making this uh, for her as a gift. So at the top, of the quilt is all done as you can see here it's sort of my own design I mean it's based on you know other standard uh, patterns but I figured out where everything was going to go um, I think it's bright I think it's colorful I hope she likes blues and purples um, because yes uh, well I do I lo definitely love blues and purples uh, but the print of the cats had blues and purples in it as well so that's why I went with that color scheme and so now what I have to do is get it layered and I will quilt it and I'll be quilting it on my embroidery machine and I'll probably do a little bit of a video about that as well although I've done one in the past I have been refining my technique so I may do a video of that and that'll come up on the idiot quilter at some point in time and give this to her and I hope she likes it and um, you know it's kind of like a little thank you gift for now this is going to sound bad but for you know putting up with my mother 
<laughs> basically. Um, but also, I, I think, you know, this, this poor lady, she, you know, really doesn't have a lot of people in her life, I don't think. And, you know, I hope this brings a little joy to her. Okay, that was one project. The other project I worked on, which is almost done, and I showed you the blocks for this uh, a week ago. This is the Dresden embroidery blocks that I was working on. And I'm going to pull way back here. And I took those and I've created this table runner. I'm really, really happy with this table runner. I think it's very elegant looking. Um, so I don't want to botch it up from here. I've got to layer it. I'm going to put something called Battleizer. Uh, Battleizer is a, a batting that's very condensed. It, it's great for things like this because it uh, lays very, very flat and solid. So if you're going to set anything on this, uh, it'll sit, you know, properly without spilling over. I do not intend to have this as um, something that, you know, you, there is a potential spilling on it. It's purely decorative. It could be washed, but I don't want to take a chance on that. So what I have to do is put the uh, battleizer in it, which is the batting, the backing. I haven't picked out any backing for it yet and uh, get that all sewn in. Now, I'm going to have to do a little bit of stitch in the ditch, probably along the borders, just to secure the layers because there is no room for any more uh, quilting on this uh, because the embroidery takes up all the space pretty much. Um, and then I'll, I'll bind it and I think I was thinking of doing this with the, the blanket turn idea, uh, you know, where you turn it inside out and pull it around, but I think I'll actually do a, a formal kind of quilting binding on this. Probably a thin strip of black, and I think that'll finish it off very nicely. So I'll be working on that this week as well, and uh, I may show it to you again once I have that part of it all done. The same with this quilt as well. I want to get these two projects out of the way as quickly as I can. Hmm, messing up my hair, uh, such as it is. Um, because uh, next Tuesday, a week from this Tuesday, I'm starting another class and I'm doing a Lone Star. And I've always wanted to do a Lone Star. Uh, the, sneaky, the tricky thing about a Lone Star, well, with some patterns, is there's Y seams. But we've already conquered the Y seams, as you know, in the uh, Giant Dahlia that I showed you a week or so ago. Um, so I'm not worried about that. Um, but I pro I'm sure I will learn some other helpful techniques. That's why I take the classes. And yeah, I've always wanted to make a Lone Star. So I'm going to. So I'd really like to have these two projects done out of my way so I can f concentrate full time on the Lone Star. Also, I still have a couple of other quilts that I've made a few months ago, a couple of months ago now, that have yet to be quilted, and I go on to get on with those. There is no lack of projects. No lack of projects. Okay, so that's what I did primarily at the retreat, and Walter was at the retreat as well, and he worked on uh, the roses that I showed you uh, last week, the embroidered roses. He was making a lot of those and people were very interested in that um, as well. Now, embroidery machines are amazing. A lot of people just think an embroidery machine is simply for putting a logo or a picture on somebody's t-shirt. They're not. There is so much more you can do with them. You can make bags, wallets in them. You can create quilts in them, as you know. Um, all kinds of things. And Walter and I both really love doing this embroidery and we love, you know, exploring the limits. And so far we haven't had found a lot of limits with an embroidery machine. So actually, if you're ever thinking about buying an embroidery machine and you can't justify the cost of them, because they are costly, um, investigate all the different projects that you can do with an embroidery machine. And you know, really, they're, they're not a one-off kind of thing at all. And you know that from what I've shown you. So, yep, and he was working on uh, another bag as well. He's the master of the bags. And uh, he's using a combination of making the bags and his embroidery machine for uh, embellishing them. And they're stunning. They're absolutely stunning. Um, maybe I should do a special video featuring Walter's bags uh, when he gets a few more. Uh, 
created. He, he gave, he's given some away uh, already. Okay, so that takes us to YouTube channel of the week. This week's YouTube channel is by Marina Coates called Mockingbird Lane. She is an architect person, I think, or an interior designer, one or the other. And what she loves to do is look at old television shows and recreate virtually the interiors of some of the more famous dwellings that various characters lived in. For example, she recreated the house for Bewitched, she recreated the Brady Bunch house, and she's done a whole other number of famous landmark sites. Of course, we never see the inside of those houses in reality because they're set up for studio uh, procedures. So what she does is recreate according to the exterior and from clips from these old shows, what the interior of the house might realistically look like. And it's really, really quite interesting the way she approaches this. So if you want to see something that's a little different and something that brings back maybe for you some nostalgic memories of old TV shows from the past, then check out Marina Coates' Mockingbird Lane. I'm trying to drink a lot of water today because I think I'm a little dehydrated. I've kind of gotten out of the habit of drinking a lot of water and that's not good. And my lips especially, I can feel them, they're really dried out. Um, the air was very dry at the retreat this weekend, and but I can feel my skin's drying out too. So that's a sign of dehydration. So got to get some hydration in me. So rather than drinking a lot of coffee today, I'm drinking a lot of water until I float or drown myself. Okay, so I've got the link for um, the YouTube channel of the week listed below and also for the book of the week and of course there is not a listing for Stephen and Walter live this week because we didn't do one as you know I already explained that so let's move right into what's pissing me off this week okay this is really going to it's something in my eye sorry this is really going to probably piss off the ladies in the crowd out there but hear me out first before you take off my head Yesterday, Sunday, was International Women's Day. Um, yeah, why? <laughs> so why do we have an International Women's Day? Really, um, I could be facetious and turn around and say every day is Women's Day, and I know that would get the women really upset with me, and they would be barking at me about, you know, the reason they need the recognition the day the whole bit because it's a man's world and men have kept them under their their thumb for centuries and women can't get ahead because of men and this recognizes the fact that women do have talents that are just as good as in, and equal to men and can do all kinds of things and shouldn't be pigeonholed and blah 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 okay I agree women are just as intelligent as men women should be treated as equals Women should uh, be seen as more than just a homemaker, a baby producer, a cook, a wife. Of course, I agree with all of that. I know because I worked for many, many years with very strong, independent, intelligent, creative women. So, I don't have an argument with that. My argument has to do with the idea that we need to have a day to recognize women. Should we not recognize women every day? Really. But I'm going to extend this, and this is what pisses me off. You can buy calendars in the store that mark the international day of whatever. Every day of the year, there is some significant day for some group or thing. I'm not sure if there's an International Men's Day. Honestly and truly, I've never looked it up to see if there is such a thing. But I can bet you, if there was, that it would be criticized by women. They're going, yeah, why do men need an International Women's Day or Men's Day? Every day is a man's day because of this, blah, 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 blah. And there we go again. My point is, and what pisses me off, is why do we need International Days of any sort? For example, why do we need a whole month dedicated to black history? Whoa, stand back. I'm going to get hit with this one. I'm going to be told I'm a racist and all this kind of thing. And I'm going to, and all the same arguments that 
people would give me when I said we don't need an International Women's Day, they're going to give me those same arguments about Black History Month. Again, I'm not being racist. I'm just pointing out that we have a whole month for a select group in our society. And yes, 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 there are thousands of arguments why we should do that. I've heard them all. I know that. And I'm not saying that we necessarily should ignore that particular segment of a society at all. But I'm saying again, going back to why do we need these international days or months? Okay, throw it back in my court. It used to be we have Pride Day. And you can argue on that. Now, Pride Day, at least in Canada, in, in the area I live in, has become known as Pride Month, the month of June. Again, all the same arguments for and against for that. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is with all of these international days of months of, don't those belittle what they're supposed to be um, empowering? really because there are so many of them it becomes something that just goes in one ear and out the other for most people okay it doesn't take on any importance really again it actually belittles the whole idea behind having these kinds of things I think if you want to recognize groups of people or certain people within our, our society you do it on a daily basis you don't have to have banners and parades to do it. You just recognize the fact or the principles that these days are supposedly bringing to the forefront, i.e. women are equal to men. Blacks have a history that should be recognized, which was important to um, the establishment of our society, of our civilization gays and lesbians and people of the LGBT community have made a significant contribution to our society as well. So we should be recognizing that for ourselves on a daily basis. Thereby, we don't need, if we did that, we would have no need for these international days or months anymore. And maybe it would be more significant if we just thought about it every day. When we come into contact with people in these groups, we should go to a part of our brain that reminds us of why these people, these groups, are significant in our society. Um, otherwise, I think, and it already happens, people start to um, become facetious about these kind of days like oh yeah international woman's day is every day oh yeah they that group gets a whole month yeah really what about me what about this okay so really having those days that were presented or created to elevate or make um or to recognize these groups becomes something more negative than positive at least that's in my opinion. So that's what's pissing me off this week, that we have all these international days of whatever. Every day is a day when we should recognize everybody. End of discussion. Okay, moving on. Um, all right, so another home decor idea. For this week's DIY home decor, I thought I'd show you miniatures. Yes, you know, people who collect little miniature houses and people and buildings. And I have quite a few of these. And they sit on my buffet in my dining room and gather dust, pretty much. This is the world's largest dust collection. So you can see on here, I have all kinds of little miniature things. And you might wonder what these represent. Well, a lot of these little places, if you look at them closely, represent places that I have been in my travels. And so every place I go to in the world, I try to get a little miniature item that represents that particular place that I've been at. Now, you may think this is a Christmas village because there is a Christmas tree, a nativity scene, and uh, some other little snow covered trees. And that is supposed to be snow, that is not dust. Although, when it gets really snowy, I do realize I need to dust it. So, 
How about some dust catchers as a piece of your home decor to bring a personal touch and remembrances of good times? So it looks like my home decor ideas are basically about my home decor and I'm getting a little depressed about that. I have a lot of tacky stuff. Okay, product reviews. I got a lot of things to show you. First of all, and, and these are, were all related pretty much to the retreat. So yes, I could do some shopping at the retreat and I did. Um, Ultimate Sewing, my local quilting store, you've heard me mention them many times before. They were the sponsors of the retreat. And of course they had a supply of their store things and they were offering them at a special price. Um, actually they were tax free that day. So I did pick up a few things. I picked up a jelly roll, um, really nice colors. I think these may, they're free spirit. Um, I think they may be K facet though. Just looking here. Yep, they are. And you know, I love K facet fabrics. So I got that. Um, and then I got these two strip packs. Now the Lone Star that I was mentioning, the class I'm about to take, the Lone Star is made up of strips. And I'm um, sorry, I got the hiccups. Um, I already have the strips picked out for it, but I thought mm, maybe I'll just throw in a couple of these just in case I changed my mind in the process. Um, so I got both of these and uh, I've got that one upside down. One is like all blues with some patterning on them, get the light off. And then this one, they call it the jewels. jewels. Um, they're batiks. I think they're batiks. Are they batiks? Oh, maybe, no, not, nope, they're not batiks. They're other, but they're, they're really pretty too. Um, now, we were given a bit of a surprise, Walter and I. Um, when we went to pay for these, and, and Walter had bought a, a few things too, um, we got them for nothing. It was a thank you gift from the staff at uh, Ultimate Sewing for doing the th stuff that we did, which I will talk about a little bit later on. I thought that was very, very nice of them. And just, you know, I, another reason why um, it's good PR, you know, because I'm going to say nice things about them and I mean them when I say them, whether they give me a gift or not, it didn't matter. But you know, that's just the thoughtfulness of the person who owns, of Shirley, who owns the ultimate sewing. She, you know, she really looks after her customers and her staff well. And that is a great reflection on, uh, on the success of her store because of that. It's great. PR, but it's genuine too. It's not just a fake thing. Okay, so I got those, and then in one of the little contests uh, that we did, um, I got a couple of rolls of uh, fabric. I think they're fat quarters in here. I haven't opened them up to take a look at them yet. I'll do that later today. Meanwhile, I saw this gizmo that. Um, was at one of the groups of, we were set up as four people in a, a sort of a pod of tables. You'll see that in the video I'm gonna show uh, in a moment. And of course we have wires coming out of the yin yang because we have to plug in our sewing machines and our irons and all that kind of stuff. And the hall that we were in, they supplied uh, industrial strength uh, outlets and things and extension cords. Cause I mean, you're drawing a lot of amperage. Uh, when you're using irons and things like that. So you could like basically black out the whole town next door. So that was all there. But there was one group of ladies that had this really neat device and I asked them where they got it. And it was on Amazon and the price was good. I immediately ordered one. Actually I ordered two because one of the ladies uh, that works at Ultimate Sewing, who was the um, overseer of the whole uh, weekend, uh, she wanted one too. So I got her one as well. She paid me for it. I'm not as generous as some people, uh, kind of a thing. But this is what it is. It's a power, up, an outlet stand, okay? It has 10 outlets in it, plus four USB connections. And the ladies had it set up in the middle of their pot of tables. 
and it was plugged in and they were running everything from this. I thought this was genius. I loved it. I love the design. I think it's great. I love the fact it's got USB uh, ports in it as well. So you could be charging your phone, your iPad, whatever, while you're sewing and whatnot. So I thought this was a very useful device. $33 on Amazon. And it was on Prime, so I didn't have to pay shipping. I ordered it Saturday. It came, it was here on my doorstep when we got back from the retreat on Sunday. So I'm really thrilled with this. It's an electronic device. I'm thrilled by anything that takes electricity. So I got that. Also, over the weekend, uh, an order that I made with Bonfil, and you've heard me talk about Bonfil in Quebec, which is a place where I get a lot of my embroidery supplies. And so I ordered, they had a special on uh, 25 spools, various colors of their embroidery thread, which I have not been using this a lot yet because you know I'm a Floriani person, although this is excellent thread, but Walter's been using it a lot and he just loves it. So they had a special, um, I think it was about half price for 25 1000 meter spools of the thread and like I said in 25 different colors. So this is just three out of the 25 of the colors. So I picked those up, ordered those and you know I'm always looking for a bargain and of course if you had an order over a hundred dollars it's free shipping so I thought well you know that was about 45 for that a few other things that I needed so I ordered a few other things now one of the things that I ordered is a thread stand uh, for the bigger cones of thread I find they're a little it's easier off the thread stand uh, to you know pass the thread through your sewing machine in some in those big cones so I ordered one of those and uh, it came as well and it's in the other room and it's just a stand so I'm not gonna bother showing it to you uh, but what else I ordered I ordered a big bag of these green clips these are really large clips and you know that I love the wonder clips uh, for things I have hundreds of those uh, but I really like these ones because they're bigger and they hold like the whole binding down very well but you can use them for all kinds of things it's you don't need these just for sewing these are great for you know clipping paper together uh other things you may have because of their size and um i don't know if i can get one out here and just show you what i'm talking about as far as size is concerned and how does this open like this there we go. so this is what they look like and so you can see the size they're well made they're very strong these are not cheap okay um this is a bag of 24 and i think i paid through monfil i think about $21 was that the I think that was about it that's pretty good if you went to Michael's and bought a package of 10 of these <laughs> without the coupon it's probably about double that price so they're great and they're great clips for all kinds of things not just for sewing as I said so I got those and I also bought a hundred glass head pins now you may wonder why glass head pins well when you're sewing and you're holding something down and you apply heat to regular pins, the head of them are usually plastic, they melt. Glass head pins don't melt. So usually glass head pins are quite expensive. And I think I got this box for about $15, $16. And that's pretty darn good uh, for glass head pins. So, um, yeah, so all told, oh, I got some big spools of um, of embroidery thread. Uh, they had a special on that too. I got three 5,000 meter spools of white and three 5,000 meter of the black. Um, I used, that was the, th the th those were the actual threads that I used, embroidery threads in the table runner, the Dresden table runner I showed you a few minutes ago. Um, I go through a lot of black and white and so I thought mm, this is a good way to stock up on it and I mean the price is so good 
on those. I think one of those spools is like $5.99 or something, and that's excellent. Um, and of course, because I bought them in this set of six, it was a little less per spool. So yeah, I had all that waiting for me when I came home as well. So now I have to put it all away. Now the other thing we got, and so this is going to be an unbagging, um, was this little swag bag of things. Now I have already looked at what was in here. I mean, how could you resist? But this was a gift uh, to everybody that attended the retreat, which is really great. So I'm just going to pull these out and show you what we got. So we got this little tin, which is very, very cute. Um, you know, you can hold uh, needles in it, whatever. Um, a little album. It's got the, it's a little pad with a pen that fits right into it. And it has, you know, the name of uh, Ultimate Sewing. So they've had these made up. But, you know, little pad, always useful. A spool of Gooderman thread. This is a 50 weight, I think, 250 meters of that. You can always use thread. And then we got some couple of different types of thread spool wraps are called. Oh, I thought these were for bobbins. Oh no, they're for thread. Oh, cool. Yeah, sometimes, you know, it keeps your thread from coming off the roll when you're not using it. So that's good. Yeah, I've got a real use for that. And these are bobbin holders. And the idea with these is you put the bobbin on them and you put them into the spool of thread. So you've got your bobbin with the thread. And I have another form of this, and actually they gave us this. I've been using these kind of things for the same purpose. Um, so I'm interested in trying these out. It's a great way for keeping your, your thread and your bobbins organized, especially when you're working on a project, because I will do that. I will pull up all the threads I'm going to use for a project, get all the bobbins prepared for them, and then if I put the bobbin into the top of the spool using one of these systems, um, it's right there. I don't have to go hunting for it. It's at your fingertips kind of a thing. Um, some safety pins, which are always good. And these are curved ones. So they're really meant for, you know, uh, when you put your layers of your quilt together. Now I use spray based. I don't pin them, but that doesn't mean these won't come into ha handy for something because they will. Um, a seam ripper, something I don't need at all because I never make a mistake. So I never have to unsew anything. Yeah, right. So that's nice. And uh, I found out that seam rippers do go dull over time. I didn't know that, but um, somebody told me that in one of the classes. And, you know, you sh once you have a dull seam ripper, well, basically it's useless. And you want to have a sharp one. Uh, because it just makes your life so much easier. So that was great. And I think there was another type of seam ripper. Yeah, we got, this one's a large stitch ripper. Um, you know, I don't see any real difference between the two of these. Well, I guess large stitch. So I guess this one's got a little bit more space in it or whatever. But like I said, can you have too many seam rippers? Well, if you make a lot of mistakes, no, you can't. So I'm kind of in that category. Um, this is an air erasable marker. Um, I have one of these and honestly, I have not used it uh, that much because it takes 12 to 24 hours, it says, for it to disappear. I don't know if I want to wait that long. Uh, I'm impatient. Uh, what else did I get in here? Like, there was a lot of stuff in there. Oh, this is extra wide double fold bias tape, which you can use as binding. Um, I have pins galore. Quilted plastic head pins. Now, these are plastic head pins. Um, so, yes, they will melt as opposed to my glass head pins, but pins are a staple. You can never have too many. Then there was a variety. And this is kind of neat. Actually, I should uh, give these to Walter. Uh, yeah. These are hardware for bags. So, yeah, I should give these to Walter since he's the bag king. And uh, they may come to use for him. I'll set those aside. Remember to give them to him. And then what else? And we got... Now these are basically wonder clips, but a different company, so they call them clever clips. 
the smaller ones. And again, you know I use those all the time, so definitely those are great to have. And then we got a couple of little pamphlets. Oh wait, this is not. This is um non uh things that hold down your rulers so they won't slide. Um, I have some of these, but you can always have more of them because a lot of rulers don't come with those on them already. And yeah, for safety reasons, when you're using a rotary cutter, you need, really need to have a ruler that has grip to it so it doesn't go sliding out from under you when you're trying to cut. Um, a little ABC pocket guide for home sewing machine needles. I think I already have one of these. And another guide as well for a needle guide. And I think I have one of those as well, too. But they're always good to have. And a pen. These pens are really great. Ultimate Sewing made them up. There's advertising for their store. But they're very, very nice. Um, I've already got a couple of them. Another one will not come to a waste. And... A, a Janome card <laughs> because uh, they are an official Janome dealer as well and uh, they may have had a few things donated by Janome. One of the other things that we were given which obviously came from Janome was a mat that you put underneath your sewing machine and it keeps your sewing machine from sliding all over the place and it says Janome on it and I got two of those one for each of my sewing machines. So that was very nice too. That in itself was exciting. But then this bag was exciting. And then the stuff we could buy was exciting. It was all exciting. Really great. So I'm really pleased with the whole weekend. We had a great time. So before we get into it and talk about that though, let's talk about the book of the week. I am sure everybody has attempted in the crafting world to do origami at one time or another and it, it can be very frustrating how to do origami um, I find because there's a sequence of folds you have to do and you need visuals for that and this is exactly what this book does now I don't know where I got this book I've had it for a while it came with origami paper and then basically it's detailed uh, instructions of how to do uh, origami and you see these tabs down here it's awkward to hold here but just traditional decorative decorations and flowers toys practical boxes animals geometrics and dinosaurs and they very clearly illustrate how to do the folding and a lot of ideas in this book. In fact, I've got to try this again because I haven't done much out of this book ever. In fact, I forgot I had this book and I found it on my shelf the other day. So it's great if you want to get into origami and the price, well, I got this, it was on sale. It says it was regularly $20 Canadian. I got it for 10 bucks, 9.99. I got it at I'm going to say it doesn't say on the price tag on the back that I'm looking at, but by the looks of things, I would say I got it at a place like Winners or Home Sense, something like that. Um, but I did look it up uh, on Amazon and the price on Amazon wasn't bad. It was $17.39. Now, they had a lot of listings for this. And this is something that Amazon sometimes does. It was $17.39, but there were other listings for it, and they ranged anywhere from that price up to $200 and something a piece. I certainly wouldn't pay $200 for that book. Uh, again, I don't know what the shipping was on this. I think the $17.39, if you had Prime, it was free shipping, but don't quote me on that. I can't remember exactly. But I think there was also, again, a selection of used ones as well. So check that out. Just be careful you, that you don't click on the $200 version of the book. Okay. All right. So that takes us to the next installment on my grimoire. So I'll show you what I've been doing with it this week. So now I'm going to put my background papers into my grimoire. 
And I found this paper collection called Codex Leonardo by, good question, by Chow Bello. It's made in Italy. My local scrapbook store has just started to, to carry this line of paper, and I love it. Um, they've got some really great designs. And although I have a ton of paper, I decided to actually buy this pad because I liked the uh, design of it. It's very uh, old looking, it's very vintage, it's very steampunkish, it's very uh, Renaissance like in looks. And there are some really beautiful papers in this set. Now these are some cutaways, some tags, which I think will come in useful as I work on the grimoire. And they're double sided sheets. One side has more of a pattern than the next, as you can see. But I really, really like all of these papers. I think they're fantastic. Look at that. That is absolutely gorgeous. And just very um, keeping with the, the mood that I'm trying to create in this grimoire of something that's very old, something vintage, vintage -y. and these are little tag-like pieces that can be cut out and used as page embellishments. And again, another page here. Just I just completely fascinated by this. And I'm so fascinated with it that I really don't want to cut it up. On the chance that if I want to use this type of paper again in a future project, I may not be able to get this particular collection. So I decided to do something that technically might be a violation of copyright. However, I did buy this paper pad and I am not selling the grimoire. Therefore, it's for my own personal use. So I think I can get away with this. And what that is, is I took each of these pages and I scanned them in my printer. Now, one thing about my printer, its scanner bed is only big enough to handle eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And these are 12 by 12. So what do you do? Well, I didn't really want to use the entire sheet of paper. I just wanted elements of it because my pages are only going to be able to handle a five by seven um, piece. So what I did was, I took my paper, I placed it on my scanner bed, I scanned it, but I scanned it at five and seven, five inches by seven inches in size. Now, that doesn't mean I reduced this page because I couldn't do that. What I did was I just selected a five by seven section of the sheet and scanned that. Now, in most cases, I was able to get, you know, two to three decent looking scans. Um, from the paper. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to insert a little video to show you how I did this process. So I thought you might be interested to see how I create my background pages for my grimoire. And as you know, I have this paper pad that has some really cool graphics and I don't want to cut it up. So I'm taking pieces of it, scanning it into my computer, and then I'll print them out. So as you can see on my big screen here, I have an image from down here that I just highlighted and scanned. So I've used my scanner in my uh, the software that came with my printer to be able to do multiple scans from the same 12 by 12 sheet of paper. Now I can't get a 12 by 12 sheet of paper in its entirety on my scanner bed. So I've only got part of it scanned into it, as you can see here, about three quarters of it, or eight and a half by 11 basically is the size. But there are some interesting images in here, and I have set this up in my settings so that I have a five by seven frame. And that will fit very nicely on the pages of the album that I'm using for the grimoire. So all I do is I take several scans uh, so I get several different background pages from the same 12 by 12. And all I'm doing is moving this frame around, which is probably difficult for you to see. Um, but I'm just going to take it, and for example, if you look above, I got those eyes. And I think I'm just going to move over here a little bit. I already have the image of this lady here in the background um, with some of the background around her in the picture. But now I think I want to focus more on her. So I'm just placing my frame, just placing my frame around her, and I'll hit the scan button, and my 
printer will take over from here and scan this image. Now it takes it a little bit of time to do this because it's not the fastest process and I am scanning at 600 dpi. Uh, now many times when people do scanning their their uh, scanner might default at, DP, at 600 dpi. I could go higher, I can go lower. The reason I'm doing it at 600 dpi is basically that's pretty much the maximum my printer can handle printing out. Um, after that it, it doesn't really make a great deal of difference in the quality. It might on some things, but not in this case. So what I'm, uh, and this will be fine for me because a lot of this is going to get covered up when I put it into the grimoire. So it's just about done. As you can see, the progression bar is going across, or maybe you can't see that. But uh, we'll just give it another few seconds here, and I'll show you what it look, what I scanned. It'll come up here onto this screen, and you'll be able to see it. And it's almost finished up. and it's saving the image now. I told it where to save it and it's opened up my folder that I'm keeping them in and I've set it up to do an automatic uh, labeling of this file. So I'll just open it and show you what I got. And there it is, right there on my screen. Don't know if you can see it that well, but that's it. So that's what I'm gonna do in this paper pad. I'm gonna go through various pages. I'm gonna take several scans and then I will print them out onto uh, some cardstock and I'll have my background pages without destroying the paper pad, just in case I ever want to use this paper pad for another project. So now you've seen uh, the process that I used for scanning these papers into my computer and then I used Photoshop Elements to print two of these pages, five by seven, onto uh, a single sheet of eight and a half by eleven cardstock. I started out using uh, a manila cardstock as you can see here because I thought it would go better but for some reason and I've had this problem before some cardstock although it's the same brand the same size the only difference is the color does not automatically feed through my printer as well as plain white so I got a few of these on the Manila but then I had to revert to the pure white it doesn't oops that's not the pure white there's the pure white but it doesn't really matter because as you can see you're not going to see the color in the background. So no problem with that. Now I made quite a few of these, but there are about uh, close to 30 pages in this uh, particular, uh, the Graphic 45 album that I'm using for this. So um, I printed these out. I used my paper trimmer to cut them and now they're ready to go. So you can see I've got quite a stack and I haven't destroyed my paper pack. I can use that for future projects uh, as well. And they scan very nicely. I scanned them at a high resolution, as I said in the previous segment, um, at about 600 dots per uh, inch. And they've come out really well. Now you might want to know what kind of printer I'm using. I'm just using a Epson uh, workforce printer. It's the ET2550. It has the tanks on it, so I'm not going to run out of ink soon and it was well it was a fairly expensive printer because of the tank system it was about three hundred dollars but basically any inkjet printer uh, is going to work for this um, is the ink waterproof mm, don't think so so I may have to if I'm going to put any wet elements on top of these once I get them into the album I may have to spray them with um, a matte uh, fixative, uh, a workable fixative, and that will protect it and I can add my wet, wet elements on top of it. But I'm not going to worry about that right now. So right now I have these pages and in the next segment what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, what it looks like when they're uh, adhered to the pages of the album and I think I am probably going to do some treatment to the edges of these uh, probably uh, just go over them with a little bit of uh, ink prob probably in a walnut stain or something like that just to give it a little bit more of an aged look on the edges and then we'll go from there so that'll be in the next segment Okay, so I will continue over the next few weeks uh, showing you what I've been doing with the grimoire. And as I said, it's going to take a while to get it finished. Get that out of my way. Need a little water. Okay, so events in the past week. Well, my mother update 
Um, I guess she's fine. I haven't seen her since Tuesday. And because we were away since Thursday to Sunday, I didn't get a chance really to give her a call, but we're going over there tomorrow again. And um, I think everything is fine. They haven't called me to say nothing out of the usual has happened, so that's great. Um, my sister just came back from Mexico. She was down there for a couple of weeks on vacation and she sent me an email and said, well, they were home, but on the plane ride home, there was somebody sitting near them who was coughing. Yeah. And uh, she said that both her and her husband weren't feeling 100% uh, yesterday. They got home on Friday. Um, but they've been checking their temperature uh, regularly and everything. And so it sounds like they just have what a lot of people get when you've been away to a warm climate and you come back to a cold climate. They may be just getting colds uh, from that or whatever. Hopefully that's all it is. Uh, the guy that was coughing on the airplane, though, my sister said uh, that the authorities met him when they landed. And I guess they were taking him off for testing. So I haven't talked to her since yesterday, well, by email, so I should send her an email today and just say, you know, how are you doing? And did you hear anything about the guy that they took off the plane? Because I haven't heard anything on the news yet about it. But then again, um, I didn't watch the news in the last few days. So I don't know, but hopefully everything's okay. Um, my mother's nursing home just sent out a whole thing about the, uh, uh, the COVID-19 virus. And, you know, what to do about, you know, preventing it because they certainly don't want it running through the nursing home because that's a death sentence right there for the people in the nursing home. Um, but it's very good information. Uh, it broke down, you know, the number of cases in what countries, uh, number of deaths in some of those countries. Uh, thank goodness in Canada, we have not had a death uh, from this virus. But it's just very very scary and there's so much information out there that is misinformation uh, so I'm trusting uh, the nursing homes uh, information uh, they sent it out uh, basically so that people would get the facts um, so we just go on I guess but anyways that's good to know um, so the sewing retreat we had a fantastic time uh, it's in a Christian uh, Bible camp, I guess you would call it, for lack of another uh, word, Christian conference area. Uh, accommodation is great. Um, it's not five-star hotel, but it's not bad. It's pretty good for the price. I mean, it's clean. It's uh, it, what, what, what we stayed in, they have various types of accommodation, actually is meant for people who, you know, short term efficiency sort of unit it has a microwave it has a full-size fridge in it it has a uh, you know kitchen sink it has you know flatware and cutlery and you know everything pots and pans and things like that um, we didn't bother to use any of that stuff except the fridge because you know we that our meals were provided and that was another thing and the meals were fine um, they don't do fish well but then again I'm not a good judge of fish because I hate fish but from what I heard, there was mixed reviews on that. Uh, Walter said it was okay. It was better than last year, but they only have it one night. Um, guess what? On a Friday, of course, because they are a Christian affiliated kind of thing. Um, but the food's excellent. They have a great salad bar. Um, yeah, salad bars are a bit of a blast from the past, but theirs is excellent. I just loved it. Um, and yeah, it was great. Uh, we had a lot of fun with the ladies uh, there. There was just Walter and I were the only two men and there were 36 women uh, there. And they're such a great group because, you know, a lot of them do know each other from classes and things from the sewing store, um, but others don't. And we went last year and had a great time. But I said to Walter, I think what would be a lot of fun would be to play some games, quickie little games, contests, have prizes uh, throughout the four days we were there to just to break the ice with everybody and, you know, get them in a, in the spirit to have fun. And so I approached uh, the organizer of this, Donna, at Ultimate Sewing, and she thought it was a great idea, so I put a plan together. And, uh, of course, our alter egos 
Matilda Mudslinger and Gladass Happy Bum did make an appearance for uh, Celebrity Bingo on the Saturday night. And I do have pictures of that. I don't have any video of it, mainly because, uh, well, there was a video taken and it may emerge on YouTube somewhere uh, out there. I don't know. Uh, because all the ladies had their cameras out. They were anticipating this. And it's basically a form of entertainment. It's, it's fun. Uh, we had a silent auction for items that were provided by the store, and that was a lot of fun. Um, we had puzzles to fill out, and you earn tickets towards the silent auction. That's how things you bid on things. You put tickets in bags and stuff like this. And... Uh, but we know what we would refine for next year when we're doing this kind of thing. Uh, we had a scavenger challenge uh, every so many minutes, hours into the, the days when we were sewing. I would stand up and ask for someone to give me a glass head pin or a seam ripper. First one that revealed it to me won a prize. And we had a lot of prizes. I mean, Donna knocked herself out getting uh, things from, you know, sponsors and whatnot. And uh, yeah, people got very competitive, um, but it was just a whole lot of fun. Um, and we were exhausted by the end of it. So yeah, will we go back next year? Oh, for sure. Uh, definitely. And possibly Matilda Mudslinger and Gladass Happy Bum will uh, make an appearance next year. Hmm. Different outfits, though. We'll see. But speaking of which, I put together, I did show a little bit of a video, about a 30-second little clip of what our environment looked like. And then I have a sort of a montage of the pictures that everybody had their picture taken with uh, Matilda and Gladass. Uh, so there's a montage of that in here as well, or a collage of that. And actually, I took uh, my selfie printer with me, uh, and I printed out the pictures. And uh, Shirley suggested to the group that if they wanted a picture, they paid five bucks for it, and were donating that money to charity. So we raised about $100 um, for the local food bank uh, by doing this, which was a great idea. I hadn't thought of that before. I was just going to give it out to them for free. But Shirley came up with this idea at the last minute and sure, that's fine. Great. I, th I thought that was an excellent idea. So something to take into consideration for next year as well. Okay, so here's my little short video of the... Uh, you have yeah, a yeah they're my, they're mostly ladies. So here it is. This is the retreat, but this is early in the morning. And so you can see not everybody is up and at them yet, just the early birds. We're the ones who feel that we don't need much more beauty sleep because we're already perfect. <laughs> so this gives you an idea of how much space we have here. And maybe later on I'll take another one when everybody's back. But today is Saturday, our last full day at the retreat. And something special later tonight and maybe you'll see a video of that or maybe you won't. So what's coming up? Uh, don't really have much coming up this week. Um, I have a guild meeting tonight um, and we have a special guest speaker and it's a man this time and that's a rarity. Um, I think he is a he's a quilter of course and I think he actually works or de demos uh, long arm uh, machines for I think it's 
APQS or is it AQPS? Whatever it is. I mean, it must be AQPS. American Quilters. I don't know. Something. Anyways, uh, so his talk should be quite interesting. I'm looking forward to that. Um, what else is coming up this week? I don't have any classes. My new ones start next week. Uh, Walter has a class tonight. He's doing a shirt making class. Um, he's always been interested in making garments. So he's taking this. And... I think he has another class later in the week and possibly next weekend too. So he's got a lot of classes. He's taking another bag making class uh, this week. And I think on the weekend on Saturday, I think he's got another uh, in the series of embroidery classes that he's taking. So he's busy. And uh, as I said, I'm gonna be working on trying to get the, this finished and the table runner finished as well. And more work on my grimoire as well and yeah so that's what's coming up this week um yeah, it's busy not that exciting maybe for some but hey i like it keeps me off the streets okay so stephen and walter live will be on air this coming sunday 4 p.m as usual and we're going to talk more about the retreat and other things as well so i hope you have a great way a great way yeah, rent it lips great week and uh, we'll see you at Stephen and Walter live or next week's vlog. Bye for now. <laughs>